Welcome to this Wise Owl tutorial on creating and using Excel pivot tables using data from Power Pivot. Here's what you'll learn during the tutorial. We'll begin with an overview of what pivot tables can do, showing features like slices and timelines. Then we'll go on to create an Excel pivot table from within Power Pivot. We'll then go on to look at what you can show in a pivot table in terms of both fields displayed and statistics calculated. We'll then go on to look at how you can show this in terms of formatting the pivot table and also we'll look at sorting and moving columns and rows. We'll then go on to look at how you can take a particular number and drill down to see its components in more detail or use the quick explore feature to see where it came from. We'll then look at two different ways to filter data in a user-friendly way, slices or date-based timelines. And finally, we'll look at how to control multiple pivot tables from the same slicer or from the same timeline to create natty looking dashboards. So let's get started. Before we begin looking at pivot tables in Power Pivot in detail, I thought I'd give you an incentive to carry on watching by showing you what they can do. So this is where we're going to get to by the end of the tutorial. I've got here a pivot table. It's showing total sales by quadrant and by species. So for example, that number 2822 represents the total sales in the north root quadrant for mammals. At the top, I've got something called a slicer. And what slicers allow you to do is to focus in on particular parts of the pivot table. So I'm going to choose using the control key to look only at shopping centers and retail parks. And what you can see is my figure there has gone down to 2630 because of excluded factory outlets and shopping parks. I can also use something called a timeline to focus in on dates. So here I'm looking at the whole range of dates, but I'm going to look at a particular quarter. I'm going to look at quarter 3, 2013. And again, my figure has gone down this time to 340 because I'm excluding, excluding seven of the eight quarters. One other thing you can do is something called Quick Explore. What I'm going to do is focus in on all the regions of the north. So I'm going to just look at regions. I'm going to drill down to that. And what you'll see is it's taken what I was looking at, which is mammals, and I'm now looking at all the different regions. And so what I can do is see that that figure, 340, was made up of 42 in the north, 169 in the northwest, and 129 in Yorkshire and Humberside. So let's start now showing how to create this pivot table, beginning with the data model we'll need. The previous tutorial in the series explains how to create a data model in Power Pivot. What, we've now, what we're now going to do is to choose which tables to include in that data model so that we can create a pivot table. If you choose 11 tables, please, in alphabetical order, they are animal, center, center type, pause, product, quadrant, region, species, store, town, and transaction. If you then choose finish, what Power Pivot will do is import the data from those 11 tables. And if I then choose close and go to diagram view, you'll see that we must have done something right because when I fit everything to screen, all the tables are related together. To create a pivot table on the home tab, you can click on pivot table and choose to create a pivot table. Pivot charts are essentially charts linked to pivot tables, so they're just more complicated versions of a simple pivot table. When you do that, you'll be returned to Excel, and I'm going to put this in a new worksheet. What you can then do is choose the dimensions of your pivot table. So what I'm going to do firstly is to choose the quadrant name. If I tick on that, by default, text fields will become row headers. And so what I'll need to do is to drag that up into the column header section. Down the left hand side I want the species, so what I can do is just click on the species name and it will automatically add it on the left hand side. What I now need to do is say what I'm actually doing within the pivot table, so I'm going to choose a numeric fi numerical field, in this case a quantity, and because that's a number, when I tick it, it will automatically assume I want to sum it and put it in the values section. I'll look later at how to customise all parts of a pivot table. That's my basic data. I can at any time right click on my pivot table and choose refresh. And what it will do is bring in the latest data if I've changed my underlying power pivot data model. So that's a basic pivot table. What we'll now do is look at how to choose what to display in the pivot table and how to customize it. So now we've got our basic pivot table, it's time to change what it shows. 
One thing I might like to do, to begin with, is to get rid of my grand totals, and I can do this in one of two ways. In general, you can do most things in the pivot table by right-clicking anywhere within it and choosing pivot table options. But this dialog box can be quite fussy and hard to find things in. In this case, I want to get rid of the totals, so I can go to Totals and Filters and just untick these two boxes. And when I choose OK, they'll disappear. But it's often easier in a pivot table to do the same thing on either the Analyze or, in this case, the Design tab of the ribbon. So what I can do here is choose Grand Totals and choose to reinstate them by choosing On for Rows and Columns and they'll reappear. And usually that's an easy way to do the same thing. The next thing I might want to do is get rid of my row labels and column labels here, which I always find un annoying and a bit unnecessary. And I can do that by going to the Analyze tab in this case and unticking the Field Headers options and they'll disappear. There's what we'll do now is have a look at how we can add grouping levels to a pivot table. At the moment, you're just grouping by species name. What we're going to do in addition is to group by the center type name. So what you can do is drag the center type name in below the species name, and you can see your pivot table will readjust to show data grouped by species, and then within species by center name. Now, having done that, you can change various ways in how your pivot table looks on the design tab. And I thought I'd briefly show you these on screen. For the report layout, you can view it in compact form, you can view it in outline form, and you can view it in tabular form. And it's pretty obvious what each of those three things does. When you're viewing it in tabular form, it can be sometimes be useful to repeat all the item labels. This means you can then select this date and copy it, and it will form a list or a table. However, on this occasion, I think it looks awful, so I'm going to get rid of the repeated labels. One other option is you can choose to insert a blank line between rows, which makes your pivot table easier to read. But what I'm going to do now is quickly undo all the changes I've made to revert to the previous pivot table and stop grouping it by center type name. Another thing you can do is you can apply filters. What I'm going to do is drag the center type name now into the filters section, and you can choose to filter it to show only center to certain center types. You can also choose Select Multiple Items to choose any combination you like of them. I can never quite see why that's not selected by default. So, for example, if I just want the shopping centres and the shopping parks, I could choose those two items and choose OK. And it shows multiple items and the filter symbol changes to show I'm not looking at all of the data. When I want to reinstate it, I can just click on All and choose OK, and I'll be looking at all of the data again. And you can have as many different filters as you like. So, for example, I could drag the quadrant name in there, and what it will do is give me an opportunity to filter by the center type and by the quadrant name. But once again, I'll just put the quadrant name back as a columns and get rid of my filter to revert back to where I was. One more thing while we're looking at pivot tables is how you can change the statistic being displayed. At the moment, we're looking at the sum of the quantity, but what happens, for example, if I wanted to count it or, or average it or show the highest value for each cell? There's various ways to do that, as there are for everything in a pivot table. The way I always choose is to click on the drop arrow and choose Value Field Settings. And when you choose that, you can choose from a range of different statistics. In this case, I'm going to take the average, and when I choose OK, I'll probably get some hideous number formatting. So in the next part of this tutorial, we're going to look at how to make your pivot table look a bit better by changing its formatting. To look at formatting, let's begin with the hideous number format we've got here. That's more decimal places than I think we need. There's two ways to change number formatting that I can think of. One usually works, the other always does. The one which usually works is to select a single cell and to right click. And providing it's the first thing you do in a pivot table once you've changed a number format, it will work fine. I can choose to change a number format, and what I'm going to do is change to show just two decimal places. When I choose OK, every single cell will be affected. I'm just going to undo that and show the other way now. The other way is to click on the Values section of the pivot table, choose Value Field Settings as we did before to set the statistic, and in the bottom left corner of the dialog box which appears, you can set the number format. So I'm going to do the same thing here, and I'll get exactly the same results, two decimal places. So that's number formats. You can also change the format of the entire pivot table. And to do that, you can go to the Design tab and choose one of these pivot table styles. Don't think there's enough? 
think again. You can click on the drop arrow and choose any style you like. You could even create your own pivot table styles and give them names and specify which color each of the different elements will appear in. To me, that's formatting gone mad. And in fact, I must confess, I always just choose the top pivot style, but just so you can see what the results would be, let's choose a jazzier one down there. And because that looks horrible, I'm going to undo it. When you choose a style, you can choose banded rows or banded columns. Banded rows will color every other row. Banded columns will color every other column. You can also choose whether you want the row headers or column headers to be colored. Pivot tables normally look better when you leave these options ticked. So that's formatting a pivot table. You can also move columns and rows, either by using the right mouse button or just by clicking and dragging. So for example, if I want this column to be slightly further to the right, I think east is less important than it appears, I can just click and drag on that. And when I click on the edge of it, a vertical bar will appear, and when I release the mouse button, it will fall into its new position. And I can do the same thing with rows. So if I think birds are pretty unimportant animals, as I actually do, I can move that down below mammals. Now finally, in addition to moving rows, you can sort. And I always think the easiest way to sort is to click in the bit of the pivot table you want to sort by. And you can either right click and choose sort and choose sort A to Z there. Or you can use the data tab on the ribbon. Because I'm in the species on the left hand side, when I choose to sort this into reverse alphabetical order, for example, the reptiles will go to the top. If I click within the quadrants at the top and do the same thing, this time west will go to the top because that's the first thing in reverse alphabetical order. And finally, I can click on any column and choose Z to A and the highest value will appear to the top. So it's always context sensitive to where you click initially, which determines where how it sorts the pivot table. Continuing our tour of pivot tables in Power Pivot and the wonderful things they can do, let's have a look at now two ways to analyze data which are called Drill Down and Quick Explore. Before I show either, let's just revert back to showing the total quantity. So I can click in the value section of the pivot table, choose value field settings, and I'm going to sum it. And at the same time, I'll take the opportunity to set the number format to show zero decimal places with a thousand separator. That makes me feel better. I'm going to look at this figure for 2609 for mammals in the south quadrant. If I want to see the underlying data which constitutes that, I can double click on it and it will show me all the rows which fed into that figure. And presumably if I summed all these figures, I would get the number 2609. Or at least I would if I wasn't just showing the first thousand rows there. This isn't dynamic. It won't update if I change the underlying pivot table data. So the best thing to do when I finish looking at it is to right click on the sheet and delete it so that I'm back to my original pivot table. The other way in which you can look at how this 2609 is made up is by using Quick Explore. Notice if you will please that it's showing this figure for mammals and for the south quadrant. When I right click on it I can choose Quick Explore and I can choose whether I want to break this down geographically in more detail or using the classification. I'm going to look at the classification, so I'm going to take go from species to look at it by animal. And when I choose to drill to animal name, two things happen. One is it groups by species, so it automatically adds a filter at the top here showing it by species. And the second is it lists the animals for that species on the left hand side. And you can see it's actually updated the pivot table at the bottom right to filter it by species name and to show the animal on the left hand side. I can continue this process to break this figure 1072 down into all the different cat products. So I can right click and choose Quick Explore and I can choose this time to look at it sorry, by product and choose product name and it will do the same thing. So I get another filter at the top and I get the um, products listed alphabetically down the left hand side. And I can continue Quick Exploring for as long as I have existing dimensions to drill down to. When I finished and wanted to get back to where I was before, it's easy enough to just press Ctrl Z to undo or to click on the undo tool. If I click on it twice, I'll be back to where I was before. So Quick Explore is a nice way to analyze data, but it does only work in Power Pivot. It doesn't work in normal pivot tables in Excel. What I want to do now is show you something called a slicer, which provides another way to filter data. And the only real way to understand these is to see them in action. To add a slicer, you can go to the Analyze tab of the ribbon and choose to insert a slicer. 
When you do that, um, Power Pivot asks you which field you want to slice the by or filled by, and we're going to choose a center time name. If I then choose OK, my slicer will appear. Because I've been working with this previously, it's pre-selected the retail park and the shopping center, but I can choose the control, use the control or the shift keys to choose any combination. Here I've chosen absolutely everything. Now you may be wondering at this point what the difference is between a slicer and a filter. And the answer to that, if I just add a filter in, is nothing. Whatever I choose in my slicer is reflected in my filter. And the converse is true as well. So if I choose the factory outlet here, you can see that's reflected in my slicer when I choose OK. But having run many training courses, I can tell you that people much prefer slicers. Not only are they easier to use, but you can make them look pretty nifty too, which is what we're going to do now. So let's get rid of my nasty old-fashioned filter and have a look at the slicer. To make it look better, the first thing you could do is align it. Now for some strange reason, this option is on the Power Pivot tab. It doesn't belong there. It belongs on the Design or the Analyze tab. You can align it vertically. However, you do have to have your slicer selected before you can do that. Or you can align it horizontally, in which case it puts it above the pivot table. What this example shows you is slicers have a nasty habit of not clearing up after themselves. So I'm just going to reset this back so the slicer appears on the left of the worksheet. Now that's all very well, but it would look a lot nicer if I could get more than one entry on the same line. And no matter how wide I stretch my slicer, that isn't going to happen. However, what I can do is go to the Options tab and choose the number of columns. I'm going to choose two, and when I press Return, it will allow me two columns. Had I chosen four columns, I would have been able to fit all of the center types on a single line, but it might have ended up being quite wide. Once more, it's up to me to clear up my extra rows and extra columns. The other thing you can do with slicers is you can format them. And to do that, if you go to the Options tab, you can choose one of the pre-existing formats, or you can actually create a new slicer style, which for me is a step too far. I'm going to choose this orange format, which I'll immediately regret. But that's how you can change slicer, the look of slicers. Now there's one more thing you can do with slicers, which I'll cover at the end of this tutorial, which is they can govern more than one pivot table. But before we can look at that, let's have a look at timelines. Before I have a look at my timeline, let's get rid of the slicer. To do that, you can right click on it and you can choose to remove the center type name, which is the name of the slicer. Don't be fooled by this little red cross, by the way. All that does is clear any filter. It doesn't get rid of the slicer itself. So I'm going to remove my slicer. And what I'm going to do now is put in effectively a date based slicer. When you have a date field, as we do in the pause table here, you can use that to filter your data in an intelligent way. To show how this works, let's add a timeline. The Analyze tab allows you to do this, and the Insert Timeline option is right next door to the Insert Slicer. They work in a very similar way. When you insert your timeline, initially it looks like you can't actually do it. There's no fields available. But that's because in this case it's just showing my active fields. If I go to All, it will list out every single field in my pivot table field list as listed on the right-hand side. That's caught me many a time. So I'm going to use the pause date, which is the only date field available to me, and that's why it's the only one the Power Pivot suggests. If I then choose OK, my timeline will appear. Now, I can format my timeline as I can a slicer by choosing one of the preset styles. Let's choose that nice blue style, which doesn't actually seem to have made a great deal of difference. I can also make a few other formatting changes here, which I won't go into. I can choose my unit. So I can choose years, quarters, months, or days. For this, it seems appropriate to divide the two years up into eight quarters. What I can then do is choose which quarters I want to select. You can click and drag from the left or the right-hand side. So I'm going to set it just to show quarters three and four. And when you do that, the date in the pivot table will automatically update to reflect the changes you've made. So it's only showing transactions where the date occurs within quarter three and quarter four, 2013. The only thing you can't do is use the control key to select non-contiguous ranges. I just tried doing that and it didn't work. So that's how slices work, sorry, how timelines work. What we'll finally do in this tutorial is look for slices and timelines and how you can use them to control more than one pivot table at the same time.
For the last part of this tutorial, as I've been promising for a while, I want to show you how you can use either a timeline or a slicer to control more than one pivot table. I'm going to have to do a couple of things to get this to work. The first is to add in another slicer. So to do that on the Analyze tab, I can choose Insert Slicer. I'll choose Center Type Name, as I did before, and just leave that floating around. I'm not too bothered how it looks. And the other change I'm going to need to make is to have a separate pivot table available to me. So to add that, I can go back into Power Pivot. I can click on Power Pivot and click on the Manage button. And what I'm going to do is add in another pivot table. I'll put it on a new worksheet. And what I'll do, um, in a very revolutionary fashion, is put the quadrant down the left-hand side and the species across the top. What a rebel. I'll also count up the number of transactions. And to do that, I can add the quantity and I can choose the value field settings to count it instead of summing it. So that's my second pivot table. What I'm now going to do is give the pivot tables names so that I can clearly see which is which. To do that, I can go to the Analyze tab with the pivot table selected. I'm going to call this first one Count Sales rather than Pivot Table 2 or whatever it was called before. And for the other pivot table, I'm going to do the same thing and call this one total sales. So now, if I can, so now I know which pivot table is which, I can get the slicer or the timeline to control them in two different ways. The first way is from the point of view of the slicer or timeline. Let's choose a slicer. I can right click on this and I can choose report connections. And what it will do is come up with a list of all the pivot tables on the current workbook. At the moment, it's only affecting the one on this worksheet, but I can also tick Count Sales and choose OK. And now, any change I make will affect both the two pivot tables. Now, if you don't believe me, let's have a look. Let's remember that figure of 97 for amphibians in the east. If I go back and choose Factory Outlet, not only will these figures change, but when I go back to the other pivot tables, you'll see that figure has gone down rapidly, or remarkably. So that's one way to do it. Right click on the slicer or on the timeline, choose Report Connections, and tick the boxes you want your timeline or slicer to affect. I've chosen the timeline here, and that's why that box still isn't ticked. The other way you can do it is from the point of view of the pivot table. So what I'm going to do is click on the second pivot table and tell it that the timeline on the first sheet should affect this too. Now to do that, I can go to the Power Pivot tab, uh, sorry, the Analyze tab, and I can choose Filter Connections. It will come up with the two slices and timelines available to me, which have got reasonably clear names. And what I'm going to do is say that I want the pause date timeline to affect this pivot table. When I choose OK, you can see that immediately the filters applied in the timeline will have an effect. And there's the name of my timeline, pause date, and likewise my slicer, there's the name, center time name. So if I make a change on this timeline, it will affect not just this pivot table, but also the one on the other sheet. Now the reason this is a wonderful thing to be able to do is it means you can create a dashboard with slices and timelines on the first sheet affecting pivot tables throughout the rest of the workbook. And not only that, but it's very easy to do too, and will impress any clients or customers of yours. And with that little thought, that's the end of this tutorial on pivot tables within Power Pivot. If you like what you've seen and heard so far, why not head over to the WiseR website where you can find loads more free resources, including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.